live in three circles of families Christians do. We have our immediate family, your mom, your dad, your brothers and sisters, or single parents, or a single person. That's your immediate family. And then we have our extended family, which is our cousins and in-laws. And then we have our church family. And in those three circles, many times we experience hurt, pain, cutoffs, abuse, neglect, lack of attention, wives starving for attention, husbands starving for attention, kids who need parents to guide them and they don't, parents who need children to follow, the pain that comes when your 14-year-old daughter gets pregnant or when you, you have, have to, to go find an attorney because your son is in deep problems. And then the verdict comes and the sentences. Things that happen in families, indiscretions, infidelities, pain, as Mimi saying, pain from divorce, from separation, from the crumbling of a relationship. When your parents abandon you because of who you married or who you're going to marry or so many things. I'm not going to lie to you. Of course, I shouldn't lie ever, especially behind this pulpit. I prepared this message and I preached it in Colombia in Spanish. And, but it's a message for here because I'd like to go deep today. I'd like to go underneath your mask and underneath your smile. Hey, how you doing? Great, thank you. Doing great, awesome. Praise God, amen, victory. I wanna go beneath that and see if God can give us some real healing in the family. I'm gonna focus on the immediate family and maybe the extended family. Let's start by asking you to remember the last or the deepest pain that you lived because somebody, someone in your family caused you that pain. And then ask you if you have really, really forgiven that person that abused you or used you or borrowed money and never paid. I stopped your business, took your wife, took your husband. Any nurse will tell you that when a body suffers a cut and it's deep enough, it'll go through the epidermis, which is your outer skin, and many cuts go through the dermis, which is the flesh underneath the skin. And sometimes the wound will he heal in the epidermis on the outside, on the exterior, but the wound will not heal in the dermis underneath. And everything looks like it's okay, but it is sensitive to the touch. And you may be the only one who knows that you're really not okay, that there's something wrong because you haven't healed. And as I was thinking about this for the past few weeks, I had to take a deep look into my heart and into my life and ask me those questions I just asked you. And yes, I found not pain that was caused by a neighbor across the street or my boss or in my case, fellow ministers and stuff with the assembly and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who really love you and you really love, and you think they love you, and they hurt you. I want to call this free indeed. Free indeed. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say 
you will be made free. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And I want to talk about that free indeed, about that saved indeed, about that forgiving indeed. I'm not going to pretend here with lofty religious words and sprinkled with biblical verses that forgiveness is easy. I'm not going to pretend that you wave a wand or you speak in tongues in a service and you forget. There's only two in the scriptures that really forgave and forgot. That was Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. The first words out of his mouth were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. And Joseph, when he was taken by his brothers to the land of Egypt, suffered all of that. And then he had two children, Manasseh and Ephraim. And he named Manasseh, the Lord has made me to forget. And anyone who has been wounded or offended or hurt, must forgive. And whether you forget or not, that's God. But I want to talk about being free indeed and forgiving indeed. Matthew says, and forgive us our sins just as we forgive those who have sinned against us. You forgive me just like I forgive those. Forgiveness means to be free, to send away. It's like a bird that is in a cage and that bird is then let free as freeing a bird from its cage. Can you imagine how silly, how ridiculous it would be for a bird who loves to be free and fly and live in its environment and it's in a cage and then somebody comes and opens the cage and the bird stays there. Forgiveness, the word in Greek, afemai, to send away, to bid going away, to say goodbye, to send forth, to yield up, to expire, to let go, to let alone, to let be, to disregard, to leave, not to discuss anymore, to give up like a debt, to remit, to keep no longer, to go away from, to leave something behind, to abandon. In other words, when you forgive, the bird flies. And does not come back into the cave. Let's learn something from the life of David. Did David really forgive? Well, forgive what? We know him as a giant slayer and as a Goliath killer and the bear and the lion. But there's, a, there's an incident in the life of David that teaches us a lot. In 2 Samuel 15, 30, something absolutely terrible is happening. His own son, Absalom comes against him. He gets 50 chariots of iron and horses, and he gathers men. This Absalom was a specimen of beauty. The Bible says that from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, there was no blemish in him. He would let his hair grow long and cut it only once a year. He was a very, very extremely good-looking man. And with that came charm, and as David was busy doing the things of the kingdom, and the lions were outside of the palace door waiting for their appointment, waiting to see the king, Solomon would walk around. And I'm sure that men and women would look at him like just saying, well, I mean, who doesn't have a, a blemish? Or who, who can say they don't have a blemish from the top of the head to the bottom of their feet? Absolutely beautiful man. And he would walk around and rob the hearts of the people and say, the king, oh yeah, good luck, good luck. He's not going to see you today. He's busy. In fact, you're just a peasant. Where are you from far away? Don't worry, but I'll take care of you. And slowly, day after day, he robbed their hearts and then he took chariots and then he came to dethrone his own father. And he fought against him and he beat him. And the scripture we have here is a scripture of hurry up and let's go. The men of Absalom are coming. David couldn't trust who was with him or who wasn't with him. That's one of the worst things in the world when you don't know who to trust. You, you don't know if that smile and that handshake is for real 
Or you don't know if they have a knife in their hand. And so here we have him now. David walking up the road that led to the Mount of Olives. And, and this is a kind of a prophetic text because we have another one many thousands of years later who also walked down that mountain of olives. Jesus Christ going to Gethsemane. And he's weeping as he went. And I guess if, if it would have been a Philistine, if it would have been a Hittite, if it would have been a Jebusite, if it would have been somebody else, you know, they came, they beat me, we'll regroup and go back. But can you imagine the, the cloud over David's head? Because it's my son who's shooting arrows at me. It is his men who have instructions to kill me, my own son that came out of my loins. My own family. And so he's weeping. His head is covered and his feet were bare as a sign of mourning. They would put ashes. It was a terrible day. It was a dark day. It was a bitter day. A king barefoot? Never. That's for slaves. That's for servants. But David had to flee. Gather his backpack or whatever he could take. And the people who were with him covered their heads and wept as they climbed the mountain. You'll find that many times, whether God allowed or not, people come and offend you when you're at your lowest. When you're already hurting, they put salt or lemon on the wound, it seems. And as David is going through this horrible process of being chased by his own son, look at the offense now. Second Samuel 16, as David and his party passed by a room, that party that we talked about in verse 30, a man came out of the village cursing them. It was Shimei, son of Hera, a member of Saul's family. He threw stones at the king and the king's officers and all the mighty warriors who surrounded them. Get out of here, you murderer! You scoundrel! He shouted at David. The Lord is paying you back for murdering Saul and his family. Two days ago, this creep would have never dared do this to David, the giant killer. He would have never dared, but now he's down, see. He's down and he's ousted from the, from the throne and he's poor and he has only a few people around him. And, and, and all of a sudden, this man is speaking for the Lord. Be careful with people who come to you with the word. So many crazies all over that have a word. I've had people come and tell me words. I tell you, well, go tell God to tell me. The Lord is paying you back. That's what you get. That's what you get because you didn't do what I said. That's what you get because you didn't meet my expectations. That's what you get. I don't know how many times I've had those. You stole his throne, and now the Lord has given it to your son, Absalom. At last you will taste some of your own medicine, you murderer. And he begins to throw rocks and dirt on his feet and to insult the king of Israel, anointed by God through Samuel's horn. And that is the offense. Well, read the story, the 15th, the 16th, the 17th, 18th, and 19th chapters of, of uh, 2 Samuel, and you'll find that David, in fact, did regroup. And David gathered his men, and David came back and took the throne from his own son, Absalom. He had to, he had to fight. He had to defend. He was the king. He never lost love for Absalom because years later when Absalom was riding a donkey, his hair, his ponytail got caught in an oak tree, yes, and he hung there as a donkey ran by. And Joab, David's 
uh, general came by and he instructed 10 of his men to put swords in him, darts in him, and there he lay, and there he died, swinging by his hair, Absalom. And then David, even though he was his enemy, he was still his son. And when they came and told him Absalom's dead, one of the saddest verses in the Bible is when David cries and cries, my son, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son, my son. Oh, if it would be me who died instead of you, my son. You can, you can almost see the pain oozing from the pages of Scripture. And David does take the throne. And on his way back, look at the apparent forgiveness as the king was about to cross the river, Shimei fell down before him. Who's Shimei? The same guy that was throwing rocks. My lord, the king, my you've changed. Please forgive me, he pleaded. Forget the terrible thing I did when you left Jerusalem. I know how much I sinned. That is why I have come here today, the very first person in all of Israel to greet you. Then Abishai, son of Zurai, said, Shimei should die, for he cursed the Lord's anointed king. And then David says, what am I going to do with you, sons of Zurai? This is not a day for execution, but for celebration. I am once again the king of Israel. Then turning to Shimei, David vowed, your life will be spared. Well... Let's close the sermon and make the altar call and go home. But you and I and David sometimes hide our hurt to our own demise. And we say things like, it's all right, forget it already. It's no big thing. Yes, it is. Because if the wound has not healed in the dermis and it's only healed in the epidermis, there's still the possibility and the danger of infection. And I've asked the Lord to, to make us free indeed. To heal us indeed. To flush out and cleanse hidden hurts. Pain that was caused 10 years ago by an ex-husband or an ex-wife or someone who came and really damaged your life. Look at the reality, and, and we're, we're jumping, of course. Now we're in 1 Kings 2 a. Walk with me into David's room. He's lying on his deathbed. He's an old man now. He's fought his wars, killed his giants, conquered, had sons. And now he stretches his sword over Solomon and he says, you're going to be the next king. Listen to him. He can barely speak. His voice is raspy and weak. Look at what he tells Solomon. And remember Shimei, son of Jerah, the man from Beirut in Benjamin. First name, last names, geography. I don't want you to get the wrong one. He cursed me with a terrible curse as I was fleeing to Manian. When he came down to meet me at the Jordan River, I swore by the Lord that I would not kill him. But that oath does not make him innocent. You are a wise man and you will know how to arrange a bloody death for him. So from 2 Samuel 19 to 1 Kings 2, the rest of David's life, he was acting as if he had forgiven. But he carried this until his old age. And he does a terrible thing. He infects the next generation with his bitterness. 
You know why many of our sons and daughters, speaking generally, do not serve the Lord? It's because of what parents talk about the church at home and in the car. You think they're playing on their tablets. They're listening. What do you think about those Rodriguez? Ah. I know them. And we infect and infect and infect. And Solomon takes the throne with all the glory and with all the temple building and everything that he did. But he was infected by his own father because David did not forgive indeed. And I want you to think. About your pain. You know, many, many of the hurts and pains come when people said, when somebody tells you what somebody said about you, and you, like a, let me say this in, in elegant Hebrew, like a tonto, you believe them. Isn't it funny? Anybody that comes and tells you what somebody said, we believe them wholeheartedly, no questions asked, and then our heart becomes polarized and damaged. And maybe they did say that, but maybe they didn't say it in that tone. People have ways of making people look certain ways, speaking half-truths, turning word, leaving things out. And, and, you know, there's pain there. When your husband, when your wife is unfaithful, pain. When you live with a mother-in-law from hell, pain. That's in the Spanish congregation. I'm sorry. When you try and you cry and you, and you do everything that is in your part, but, but they just can't. They just won't. What do I do? Today we need to forgive indeed. David could have really forgiven he, had, he was king. He retook the throne. The, the, the finances, the, the army, the, the, everything. He, 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 this was just some crazy guy that cursed him. David could have forgiven, but he didn't. And you have a choice today. You can do as you've done for what? Two years? Five years? How about 25 years? Come to church, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and you carry... That with you. And as I was praying even this morning right there. I said Lord bring to me. Is there anything in my life. In my family. That I've been carrying. And that I haven't forgotten. And the Lord took me to something in my immediate family. Uh, excuse me, my, my, my family, my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters and me. And I wept and I said, Lord, flush this out because that stuff hides. It hides under your praise and under your song. And under Lucille's, when you go have ribs with your friends, it hides when you work and get busy. It hides as you serve. It hides as I preach. It hides as I sing. It hides. I want to show you something. Um, I, I, want you to, I want you to go to the... To the chart? Is there a chart? Yeah, go to the chart. I want to show you something. Right there. Go back. Go back, maybe. Okay. Go back. All right. I want, I want you to see this scripture in, in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. It says, it says, be angry, but do not sin. The fact that somebody hurts you, damages you, offends you, uh, deceives you. God is not saying, don't be angry, you, you have the Holy Ghost. No, you're human. 
You do not have to deny your humanity. Good. Be angry. Don't sin. And then it says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, don't go to bed angry. Or don't have a season of allowing that anger to turn into bitterness and to ferment. Like battery acid, it'll destroy the cup that holds it. That other person who's offended you is in Disneyland. Coming down the Matterhorn with her hands up. Screaming hallelujah. And you're bitter. You're sick. Because it says neither give place to the devil. Now that word place, let's go to the chart. That word place, that means jurisdiction or parcel or parcel because when when I'm offended and angry and I do not flush that out with genuine and real forgiveness I'm talking about the stuff I'm not talking about okay I'm sorry okay okay that's good give me five okay you know little fingers of whatever you guys do no no I'm talking about sobbing in the prayer room for weeks, I'm talking about going through the valley of shadow of death. I'm talking about when you scream at God saying, where are you? This is unfair. They're lying about me. They're, they're planting drugs in my trunk, whatever. I'm talking about when you're going through pain and you can do nothing about it. Well, Ephesians 4.26 says, don't give parcel, don't give land to the enemy. Why? Give me one click. Because the enemy will come into your soul. That, that, that checkerboard there is your, your heart, your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, where you live, where you think, where you suffer. And when I don't forgive and I let the sun go down on my wrath and I give parcel, place, a piece of property to the devil, the devil's not dumb. He will build a castle. That's a stronghold. What is a stronghold? Um, give me the, another click. Now. I didn't, I didn't tell you to, 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 to click, quit throwing bombs, Putin. I'm sorry, I'm kidding. There's a story in Matthew that Jesus said that there's one man who is, you know, doing his bills and looking at his accounts and he, hey, this guy still owes me, let's call it $10,000. So he calls him over and he says, hey, you owe me $10,000. The debtor, the man who owed the money, came, comes and tells him, Oh, I know. Give me time. I will pay you. I want to pay you. I just haven't been able to, but I will pay you. And this rich man was moved to mercy. And he said, You know what? I forgive you your debt. You don't have to pay me. So that he goes away. I mean, how would you feel if somebody forgave you a large amount of money? So he's walking down the steps of that tribunal and he meets another man that owes him $10. And it's like, hey, talking about debt, hey, you owe me 10 bucks, remember? And the man told him the exact same thing that he told the other one. I want to pay you. I can't give me time and I will pay you. But this guy took him by the neck and he said, no, you owe, you pay or you go to jail. Back then, you didn't get welfare and, you know, nobody paid your bills. You go to jail, and he threw him in jail. And then somebody went and told the first man, hey, you just forgave this guy $10,000, and he met somebody who owed him $10, and he threw him in jail. So this guy calls this guy back, and he says, hey, how is it that I forgave you just a few minutes ago $10,000 and you couldn't forgive $10 and you threw that man in jail? 
Throw him now to the tormentors. And that's where the parable stops. And then Jesus says this. So likewise, just like that, my Father in heaven will do to those who not forgive from their heart the offenses of their brother. So likewise what? So likewise, they will be thrown into the tormentors. Now look at the problems Christians have, and we don't even understand why. Who are the tormentors? The tormentors are emotions. And so now the devil, because you have a hurt that you didn't resolve, because I, who was forgiven by Christ on the cross, he forgave all my sins. I am memorizing Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 in Spanish. And it blew me away. It says, because through by the sin of one man, through one sin came condemnation over all the earth. Through one sin. In other words, I have sinned more than Adam sinned. All Adam did was eat the apple. You've sinned more than Adam. You ate the calabaza. You ate the watermelon. You ate everything. You see? And if God forgave you and me our filthy sins of spirit, mind, and body, everything. Those of us that grew in the church don't say, oh, no, no, I get you too. Maybe even worse because we used to hide in the cocina to do them. And so now the devil has a, I'm not saying you're demon possessed. I'm just saying you are oppressed or you have you have allowed the enemy to come and now he brings a stronghold what is a stronghold a stronghold is a thought i can't forgive that oh anything but nobody else has suffered what i've suffered there's no way that i can forgive that there's just no way those are strongholds that's why the bible says that we must be pulling down strongholds the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so what happens? Now click. So from there, the enemy from within you, the enemy starts throwing bombs. Now throw bombs. So you're angry. Keep throwing bombs. So you're lonely. So you're worried, so you're guilty, so you're fearful, so you're depressed, so you're inferior, and so many others. And watch, here's what happens. We go to God, and we say, Lord, help me, I'm depressed. And God says, um, yeah, I know, I'm the one who threw you over to your tormentors. I'm the one who, who's allowing that to bring you to repentance. See, when I don't forgive Indeed, who do I damage? I damage me. And I, I can say a lot more this morning. But I, I pray that God would allow us to flush out that one thing you've been carrying there. Who was it? The one who abused you? Should have he or she? Of course not. They should be in jail probably. How about your first wife or your second wife or... or, 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 or Whoever divorced you, whoever deceived you, whoever was unfaithful to you. How about when your husband doesn't change and doesn't change and doesn't change and doesn't change? Or your wife? Or your kids? Or favoritism in the family? Or so many things. And you can decide today if you're going to carry that, that for the rest of your life. And it's not so bad that it's an explosion of battery acid. It's just a leak. It's just a little leak. And, and here's what happens. When God really wants to bless you, I'm talking about a blessing, of spiritual blessing, that kind of blocks it from going deeper than God wants. When God wants to, for you to enjoy the joy of the Lord and really be joyful and happy and, 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 and joyful in spite of the circumstances, that battery acid just keeps. And it happened 30 years ago. 
and it happened 20 years ago. And you're still, well, what are we going to do? Let's, let's go, as a pianist comes, quickly, please. We need, to, we need to knock down that castle if we're going to have any victory, and we need to regain the ground. We're seeing it right now with Ukraine and Russia. Russia's trying to gain ground, and Ukraine's trying to hold it back and gain it back. It's a war. So here's, here's what we do. First of all, confess the sin of bitterness to God. That's a hard thing to do. I'm all right. I got the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Confess the sin of big Lord, I am bitter. Deep down inside where nobody knows. Bitter against a pastor who, whatever to you, who did whatever, a grandpa. We confess our, if we, number two, uh, if we confess our sins, um, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every, if we confess. Some may have to come to this altar in the next two minutes and confess, Lord, yes, I've been hiding this bitterness for a long time. The second thing we have to do is claim the blood of Jesus over our hearts. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not gold or silver. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And then, ask God to restore your ground. He restores my soul. This word is taken from a lamb that is in need of restoring. The shepherd would look at his sheep and one of them for some reason would turn on his back. Maybe there was a little indention in the heel or his, his wool got caught in a thorn bush and he tried to get out of it and in the snag he rolled over and a lamb in need of restoration has its feet in the air and there's a few dangers. The wolf or coyote or lion can come and get him. And because he's upside down, the gas is in his system, can intoxicate him. And he can die within minutes because he's upside down, delicate. And the only thing the lamb can do is cry out to the shepherd. And when the shepherd hears that, that cry, that urgent cry, it's not just a, a regular uh, sound of the lamb. It is an urgent cry. And, and maybe for the first time in forever, somebody this morning needs to come up here with an urgent cry. Restore my soul, God. I've got so many emotions and bombs that are it's inside of me and I don't even know. I feel good at the altar, but then I walk out and it's just the same. You need to ask God to restore the ground, restore the territory. And then after that, you need to pull, number four, please, cast down and destroy those strongholds, those thoughts. We use God's mighty weapons, not mere worldly weapons, to knock down the devil's strongholds. With these weapons, we break down every proud argument that keeps people from knowing God. With these weapons, we conquer their rebellious ideas and we teach them to obey Christ. And lastly, we forgive those who have offended us. If you forgive those who sin against you, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, indeed, for real, your Father will not forgive your sins. So who, who, uh, who offended you? Your Father? Because he went with another woman? And he's got another family. And he made your mother suffer. And he made her, made her live a horrible life. And you had to work at 12 years old because your mother couldn't support you all. Or you had to take care of the kids. Or you had to become a little lady at 8 years old because you had to wash and cook. Or was it your mother who did that? Or your children who offended you? How about your spouse? Wife, ex-wife, was it a pastor? You gave all you could to that church, to that service. And then your relatives 
Or maybe you offended yourself and you need to forgive yourself today. So, uh, let us stand. And let us come to this altar and leave that here. And let the Holy Spirit flush. So what we have to do, church, we have, we have five, six more minutes for church here. But we need to create an ambience and an atmosphere of worship and praise. So that, the, so that the Spirit of God will come down and clean and flush and heal. There might be 30-year-old offenses here at left at this altar. 40 years, 10 years, I don't know. Maybe they're fresh. But somebody may need to come up and say, God. Help me forgive like you forgave. In fact, today, let us kneel. Let us not stand. Let us kneel. Let us kneel. Somebody who's made you suffer all of your life and you feel stuck.